Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk to you today about how we're using technology and management techniques to make our farming system resilient and um, how we can manage through difficult and trying times. So our farm is in southern New South Wales. We're about halfway between Albury and Wagga. We dry land grain growers. Um, a quarter of our country is non-arable, so we run cattle on that because I don't like sheep. And um, the rest of it, we continuous crop. My father's quite an innovative man and he got into no-till in the late 1970s. So we've been, I've never actually cultivated paddock in my life. So today I, I could talk about a lot of things that we're doing that are making a difference, but there's two I really want to talk about. How we're using integrated weed management to deal with herbicide resistance. And how we're trying to maximise the most grain we can get from um, the amount of water we have. So why is integrated weed management important? <clears throat> Well, herbicides have let Australian growers develop farming systems that are actually suited to Australian environment. With herbicides, we've been able to be, take up no-till. We've been able to retain our stubbles. Our forebears brought European farming systems to Australia, and they weren't always that successful. Cultivation with our fragile, old, shallow soils isn't such a wonderful thing. Herbicides have been a great asset to us Australian far grain farmers. They're cheap, they're safe, and they're effective. And because of all those reasons, we've tended to overuse them. Herbicide resistance develops when you only use one form of weed management. Weeds are a very clever thing, you wouldn't think so, but they adapt to whatever a farmer's doing. And so when we're totally relying on herbicides, the weeds have adapted and beaten resist made resistant weeds. Resistance isn't um, solely a problem for herbicide growers, uh, herbicide uh, conventional farmers. On my Nuffield scholarship, I had the opportunity to visit some organic growers, and that's a paddock of wheat in Denmark, organic wheat. And you'll probably notice there's quite a lot of weeds in there. And they're actually perennial thistles. They're quite deep-rooted. And being organic farmers, the only form of weed control they were using is cultivation. These weeds have deep enough root systems that they got resistant to cultivation. So the moral of the story being that if you're only using one form of, herb of weed management, it's going to fall over. And so for us, because we were early take uptakers of no-till and early um, people that went into continuous cropping, we were also early um, victims of herbicide resistance. And so to about 2000, we actually had total crop failure from herbicide resistance. And at the time, we were really quite stressed about it. Did it mean that we were going to have to totally change our farming system? You know, were we going to have to go back to cultivation and all the horrible things that happened with that? Or were we going to have to bring in sheep into the system? And that just wasn't something I was really um, willing to consider. But what we actually had to change was our mindset. We had to change the way we were thinking about how we were dealing with weeds. And so the thing that really we had to do was stop preventing weed seeds getting into the seed bank, getting onto the ground, staying there so that they could grow. Because every weed that's, seed that's on the ground is one more weed that I need to kill with a herbicide. So we've been doing things like brown manure, where we grow a legume, which in our case is uh, lupins. We sow it quite thickly, almost no inputs, and then we come back in the spring and use glyphosate to take out everything that's growing there and just let the whole lot rot down. It's a costly uh, measure because um, you're getting no income from that year. But we are finding that we're getting a lot of benefits in added nitrogen. So we're being able to grow a crop the next following two years with a lot less nitrogen. And it's been a major way of hitting that seed bank down. Because if you can get two years of seed control, if you prevent weed seed set for two years continuously, you will beat uh, weeds. Another tool that we've been using quite a bit of is the old-fashioned just cutting, some, cutting the weed patches into hay and silage. 
Herbicide resistance doesn't develop over the whole paddock instantaneously. It usually starts in a small area and then the harvester picks up those seeds and spreads them. So if we go in and minimise that spread by cutting the weeds, and we can use, we're fortunate we can use that hay in our cattle operation, but we prevent the seed set and it just keeps the overall seed bank numbers a lot lower. I'd just like to say that photo, I don't normally cut an area that big, but that was actually a frosted wheat crop last year. Something else that's been very successful for us and we've been using for about 10 years now is narrow windrow burning. We put a simple chute on the back of our harvester which condenses all the residue into a narrow row. Um, we only use, do this in canola because we've got far too much residue in wheat. And then we come back in the autumn and we slow burn it. Our aim is to get that windrow to burn at 400 degrees Celsius for a minimum of 10 seconds. And so that, that length of heat, time and heat uh, makes most seeds unviable. And if you don't believe me, there's a photo of a row that not all of it got burnt. You can quite clearly see the amount of weeds that are coming up you can also see further up the row where the row did burn, there's a few small amounts of weeds. The thing with all of these techniques is none of them kill 100% of seeds, and that's why farmers tend not to, traditionally have tended not to use them, because they're not 100% effective. But in combination, using them all together with herbicides, we've been able to knock our weed seed numbers right back and really get on top of the problem. So for us, not only are we looking for just things that give us weed control, we're also trying to use agronomic best practice that while we're trying to get maximum yield, we're also trying to get some weed control benefits. So using high seeding rates when we sow, so the crop's thicker and outcompetes the weeds. Using varieties that have early vigour, so when they're seedlings, so they grow quicker so that we get the ground covered so that it's much harder for weeds to germinate in the shade. We're using precision machinery that strategically places the fertiliser so the crop's got the advantage. There's not much future in fertilising weeds. We want our fertiliser all where the crop can get it and it's much harder for the weeds to get. We're using a two centimetre accurate GPS system which lets us go back. We've got 12 inch row spacings. We can shift that uh, over by six inches or 150 millimetres each year and plant than this year's crop in last, between the rows of last year's re crop's residue. So that's giving us the advantage of where the weeds, not only do they have to deal with crop competition, they're having to deal with the crop residue. And we're using press wheels. Press wheels give us good soil seed uh, contact, which again gives us better germinations, which gets the crops out of the ground quicker, again, to outcompete the weeds. We got into variable rate lime a few years ago after the drought. During the drought, uh, lime's one of the easiest things to knock off the budget when you haven't got any money. And so we only had a limited budget and we wanted to make our lime go as far as we possibly could. So we started doing pH testing and on the right you can see, is your right? Yes, you can see a map of a paddock that's been pH tested. Traditionally in our area, you would look at putting a blanket application of two tonne of lime to the hectare. When we mapped that paddock, you can see the red area, it's, that paddock's 45 hectares, and the red area is about four hectares. So we were able to go in, it needed three tonne of lime to the hectare. So we went in and actually, we only need to put 15 tonne of lime on that paddock. So it was a major cost saving, and in the last three years, we've probably saved between seventy and eighty thousand dollars in lime savings, while actually getting the lime where we need it most. But the thing that really um, stuck out very quickly when we started seeing all those maps was guess where the weed patch was? It was that low pH area, that red area? And whether it was because the crop isn't competing as well or the weeds are more tolerant to lower pHs, we're not sure. But at the end of the day, with a bit of variable lime, we're actually getting more competitive crops, more even crops, and it's much harder for the weeds. So the message on um, herbicide resistance is it is beatable. It just needs a change in strategy. It's a bit more work 
you don't go to town to buy a solution anymore. We still use lots of herbicides, but we need to be far more strategic and farm as if there's going to never be any more new herbicides. The other thing I want to talk about is how we're trying to maximise our water use efficiency. And the obvious question is, what is water use efficiency? Well, it's taking the grain yield we get and dividing that by the plant available water and measuring it in kilograms per millimetre of plant available water. So what's plant available water? Well, we take the rainfall that falls from the time the crop is sown to the time it starts ripening, less the evaporation and transpiration, less runoff, plus stored soil moisture. And of all those things, we can deal with, I can affect evaporation. Retaining my stubbles prevents her evaporation. I can try and minimise runoff. So no-till makes the soil more porous, so we get more infiltration. And stubble, again, slows the runoff. We can gain more soil soil moisture because um, if we control summer weeds, but the one thing I can't change is the amount of rainfall. And so once we realised that that was our constraint, we realised that we needed to work, you know, I can bring, or change almost anything else in my business. I can bring in more capital, I can bring in more labour, or I can buy fancy machines, but I can't make it rain anymore. So our change in management strategy was that we need to maximise the amount of grain to maximise our profitability from the rainfall we've got. And our goal is to average 20 kilograms per millimetre of plant available water in wheat. So, conserving summer moisture. Traditionally, in southern farming systems, conserving summer moisture is not, has never been done. We've tended to graze anything that grows in the crop with our livestock side of the farm. But we're finding that it's really making a huge impact. When we've got that stored summer moisture, we're now no longer dependent on getting an autumn break to be able to plant our crops. Every crop, every variety has an optimum sowing window. If um, you go past that optimum sowing window, your maximum potential yield starts dropping away and there is nothing you can do about it. So we now no longer need rain. And in 2013, we were actually able to grow our, plant our entire crop on less than 10 mils of rain during the planting window because we had that stored summer moisture. Because we've got summer moisture, it means we can sow our crops earlier. We can use now longer season varieties that tend to yield higher. Traditionally, in our area, you'd never start sowing before Anzac Day. Today, we're looking at starting sowing from about the 5th to the 10th of April. And for every dollar we spend on um, summer weed control, we're getting about $8 back, which in my book's a pretty good return on investment. I wish the banks would do just as well. So this is some data from the Climate app, which is an app that's partially funded by GRDC. They've got climate data for all over Australia, and this is from my nearest um, weather recording point. And we're asking it, how often do we get 50 millimetres of rain, which is what you would sort of ideally like to plant your crop on, during April and May in the optimum sowing window? And when we look at it, it says we're only getting that 34% of the time. And the really interesting point, if you look at the bottom bar, is that it hasn't happened since 1999. So possibly if the autumns are getting drier, we're more and more dependent on that stored soil moisture to be able to plant our crops in the optimum window. This is some work from James Hunt and John Kierkegaard from CSIRO. They were the two gentlemen that had the idea of what would happen to our farming system if we started controlling summer weeds. And if you have a look at the data from Yarrawonga and you look at the plant available water with no summer weed control, you're looking at 19 millimetres. With summer weed control, it's 49. 30 millimetres doesn't sound like a lot of stored soil moisture, but when you look at the difference in yield, 2.1 to 3.6, it's quite significant. And that's what we're finding in our district as well. Paddocks that have got no summer weed control in 2000 were yielding between two, two and a half tonnes to the hectare. The ones that had summer weed control were yielding four. 
So what's this mean for the bottom line? With CSIRO's figures, the cost of doing that summer weed control is about $34. An extra return of $300, which is a profit of $270. It's extra profit. It's almost money for nothing. And in 2012, when wheat was $250 a tonne on farm, for that $30 extra, we were getting nearly $500 extra income. That made a huge impact to our bottom line. For a lot of people, it makes the difference of whether they're making a profit or not. So summing up, farming systems are complex and we're really looking for um, new ideas that give us multiple benefits. We're not just chasing yield. We want to be able to get higher yields, better water use efficiency and less weeds. We are getting productivity growth. Earlier I said that our goal was to average 20 kilograms per millimetre. In 2004, when we weren't doing summer weed control, our average was 12. 2012, it was 19.5. I didn't quite crack the 20. 2013, we had a frost and it stuffed it up, but we were still able to get 12 and a half kilograms. And in the paddocks that weren't frost affected, we were able to get between 20 and 25 kilograms. And that was on a spring that was 75 millimetres below average. I think there's an urban myth out there that we farmers don't tend to change. This is farmers do. We're constantly evolving our systems and I think um, when we see something that works for us, we're quite happy to grab it and run with it. I think the other thing that's quite important and I've been quite pleased to hear it today is that research is crucial. All of these things that I've implemented in my farming system have all been ideas from researchers that researchers have then quantified and farmers have put into practice and qualified. And without organisations like CSIRO, GRDC that are adequately funded, I think uh, Australian grain production can't continue to grow and can't continue to be resilient. So thank you.